all of you this morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity and the pleasure and the privilege of being able to come before you on this marvelous day that God has granted us, again, allowing us to witness the beauty of his creation for all of you who are assembled here in the sanctuary. Uh, we are still transitioning, making the adjustment uh, in our inability to uh, come in corporate setting, but we are grateful to God for the uh, gift of technology uh, that allows us to retain our connectivity to the various components that are represented here this morning, uh, stewards and trustees, stewardesses, ushers, to my wife, Sister Pam, and this phenomenal music ministry. Uh, we thank you for allowing God to uh, use you in sharing your gifts uh, in aiding in creating the uh, atmosphere uh, for worship to our worship participants. We thank you for your presence and for your participation. Some weeks are more challenging than others. Some are more taxing than others. It's like in the uh, work setting, there are some days when you have one task behind the other and seemingly unable, uh, metaphorically speaking, uh, to catch your breath. And uh, this past week has been a very, very challenging and taxing uh, week for me. Uh, I appreciate, I, as stated, the utilization of uh, technology, uh, Zoom and the various other platforms, uh, conference calls, which allows us amid this uh, pandemic to remain in contact. But I've about zoomed out. Uh, I'm grateful, I'm, I'm appreciative, and God uh, knows it's, it's needed uh, amid my uh, week this week and uh, two, two Bible studies and uh, doing visitation. And, uh, I preached a eulogy for a young man early in the week and uh, uh, had two Zoom conferences on yesterday, our fourth quarterly conference, and then we pastors had an orientation uh, Zoom with the bishop, and then there was another Zoom that I was to have been on right after that conference, but I forgot all about it. And the fact of the matter is, I was I was inclined, I I, I was tempted to, uh, to to tap to call one of the uh, ministers who serve so faithfully here at Union because they've known I've always have taught them as the Bible says, be ye also ready. Uh, we who are in ministry, we, we learn from a very uh, early year in our, as a part of our preparation. We were taught by the seasoned elders of the church uh, that a preacher should always keep a sermon ready because you never know when you might be called upon to preach. In fact, there was a time at the annual conference uh, when we were in session and when they would have uh, midday worship at the high noon hour at worship. And sometime the bishop would motion for one of the preachers in the conference, maybe 10 minutes before 12 and would say, you're going to preach at 12. But then, but then like Jesus, uh, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the river of Jordan, the Bible says to us, King James, and afterwards, he was compelled to go into the wilderness there to be tempted by Satan. And so I feel compelled uh, to come before you uh, this morning, not standing on my own strength, but standing on the power of God Almighty. Father, I stretch my hands to you. No other help I know. If you withdraw yourself from me, Lord, whether shall I go? Permit now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart are found acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are my rock and my redeemer, and the people of God say, amen. My wife, whom I know is praying for me, sometimes I said to her, I said, pray for me today. She said, I always pray for you. So I appreciate you praying for me today. This morning, I invite your uh, prayerful attention to 
uh, a book in the Bible, uh, the Gospel of John. And I know some of you keep a log of, of my sermons, and I know we're celebrating, as I said moments ago, we are giving focus to uh, all timers. So I don't think, I don't want you to think that I have dementia of all timers because I have preached from this text a few weeks ago. But uh, as a part of my morning devotion, in addition to us convening at the eight o'clock hour wherein we, we, we try to create as we've done here today, an atmosphere of worship and celebration with music and we, we have prayer uh, and uh, we, we have scripture read and someone will uh, share words of encouragement or inspiration. In addition to that, in my personal devotion, I, I was inspired to, uh, to, to preach this, this sermon uh, it's taken from, as I said, John's Gospel, uh, chapter 17. And I want to read the first five verses and then uh, make reference to other verses contained in that chapter. John, chapter 17, beginning at verse 1, we find these words. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is the eternal life, that they may know you and own the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. For a topic, for a thought, for which to preach this morning, I offer for your consideration, say a little prayer for you. Say a little prayer for you. From, from our days as, as children, uh, we, were, we were taught by our, our family members, our parents and grandparents about the importance of prayer, that uh, prayer ought to be an integral part of our lives, but that, that, that we shouldn't do anything without first praying to God and seeking God's guidance and seeking God's direction. We, we, we were taught that before you partook of one morsel of food, that you always pause and gave thanks in prayer. We were taught as children growing up that uh, the gospel as recorded by Matthew chapter 9 verses 9 to chapter 6 verses 9 to 13 and also in Luke uh, chapter 11 verses 2 through 4 which is a shorter version of what is contained in Matthew's gospel we were taught that that was the Lord's prayer but in actuality the Lord's prayer is contained in John 17. John 17 is the Lord's Prayer, and you, 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 you will understand why. The, 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 the prayer that was contained and is contained in Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel when uh, the disciples on numerous times had observed Jesus in the posture of prayer, one day one of them asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus began to expound. He began to say, when you pray, you should say, our Father, which art in heaven, etc., etc., etc." When we look at that prayer, that prayer is the model that we should use whenever we go to God in prayer, that we, we begin by giving God acknowledgement, that, that by adoration, we, 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 we move forward and acknowledge a confession. The prayer in Matthew and Luke reminds us of the sovereignty and the supremacy of God. It is in Matthew and Luke wherein we are reminded of the importance that we ask 
God, that we petition God to forgive us of our mistakes, of our sins, of our transgressions, of our debts, and that's the conditional part, as we are likewise to forgive those who have trespassed against us. But in this 17th chapter of John's gospel, we, we find uh, a Jesus doing something uh, uh, you know, it, it, that is not recorded often in scripture. Jesus was always in a posture of prayer. And, and, and in his prayer, uh, it, 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 of course, it allowed him the opportunity to commune with God. But more times than not, when Jesus praying was praying, he wasn't praying for himself but rather he was praying for others. But in this 17th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus is praying for himself. And, 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 and he begins uh, his prayer by, by making a petition to his father. Uh, uh, this, beloved, you, you will note, uh, as we, uh, we are in the season of Lent, this was the most crucial period in the life of Jesus Christ. Soon he would be arrested and taken from judgment hall and judgment hall and soon he would uh, stand before Pilate and soon he would be compelled to carry his own cross to the place of the skull called Gotha. We call it Calvary. Soon he would have a crown of thorns placed on his head. But now we, we see as Jesus is in the posture of prayer. He is articulating a petition to God. Here, Jesus, he 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 tells his disciples. You know, he it, they, they had already had what we call the Last Supper. He had told them that one of them was going to betray him and that he was going to leave them, but not leave them comfortless. Jesus is praying for himself. That's all. Because there aren't many instances recorded in scripture where we find Jesus praying for himself. Beloved, this is important. It's significant in that it, it, it points out uh, uh, that if Jesus prayed for himself, then we ought to also pray for ourselves. Uh, oftentimes, particularly those of us who, who are in, in, in ministry, we are, we are, we are petitioned, we, we are request, we are, it is requested of us that we pray for this one and pray for that one. And that's a part of our calling. And we do it with a glad heart and with a willing spirit. But every now and then, when we go to God in prayer, we, we need to remember amidst of our praying for other folk, we got to pray for ourselves. That, 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 that was a saying that was said in the earlier days of the church where people would say, you pray my strength in the Lord. Don't, don't, don't pray that I live long or that I die soon, but please pray for me, beloved. That's all right, but every now and then, you got to pray for yourself. Yeah, and, I, 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 and when I say that, I'm not advocating, I'm not suggesting that when we pray that we go to Jesus with a litany or with a laundry list or that we treat Jesus like a, ma a made of D, that we ask God to give us this and ask God give us that. But no, asking God by the power of his Holy Spirit to provide us that which we need, that which we cannot provide ourselves that we may be able to move forward in fulfilling that which he has called us to do. And so the first part we notice in this chapter is that Jesus prays for himself. And then we move on further. Not only does he pray for himself, but Jesus prays for his apostles. Verse 6 says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. Jesus prayed for his apostles. These were those who had been 
trained by him and have been given leadership responsibilities and it would be their charge, it would be their duty to continue on that which they had been taught by Christ after praying for himself. Jesus prayed for others. Here, Jesus makes an expression of, of the importance of, of love between himself and his Father and the Holy Spirit. He, he, he admonished, he encouraged, he emphasized to his disciples that they love one another as God do Jesus love them. He encouraged them to work in a spirit of oneness, a spirit of unity. Let there always be peace and harmony among yourself. Beloved, I like to believe that when Jesus was praying for his apostles, that he was also praying for you and that he was praying for me and that he was encouraging us to do the same thing that he had encouraged the 12. Love ye one another Work in, to, work in unity, work in a oneness of heart. So after Jesus prayed for himself, then he prayed for his apostles, those whose task it would be to carry on after Jesus would have returned back to his father. The text also tells us that Jesus finally in this prayer, which is regarded as the longest prayer prayed by Jesus. It's called the priestly prayer. And, 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 and Jesus is our high priest. He prayed for himself. He petitioned his father. He knew what he needed to have as he moved forward in the task that was before him. Then Jesus prayed for the 12 and asking them to remember the importance, the value of working in concert and exercising a spirit of oneness and unity. But third, Jesus, then he prays for the church. Uh, and, and, and make no mistake in confusing the church with the church house. Uh, uh, if ever we were confused as to making the distinction, we have certainly have been reminded Lo, these past two years that we have, for all intents and purposes, have been isolated from one another. The church is you and the church is me because a part of us, uh, the, the a part of the church is in us. We are a part of the ecclesiast, of the ecclesia. We are the part of those who have been pushed up by the plow or sheds of the gospel. We are the church. We are the representatives. We are the examples of what God intended for humankind to be. Jesus prayed. He prayed for the church. And knowing, knowing of what the church would be up against after his departure, he emphasized how important it was for them to remember all of the things that he had taught them. Jesus said, I want you to understand that you have an awesome responsibility ahead of you. Jesus said, I, I don't want you to be confused. I don't want you to get it twisted. I don't want you to become discouraged when as a part of the body of Christ, you comprise the real church. Jesus said, don't get upset when folk hate you because I want you to understand that you're not the first to be hated. For the Bible says, so persecuted the prophets which were before you. Jesus said, I want you to understand, don't be discouraged when they hate on you because I want you to know that they hate on me. And if they hate on me, they're going to hate on you. God said, I want you to understand that you have a large responsibility. God said to his son, through Jesus, don't be discouraged. Don't become dismayed. You are the church. You must remember that you're not in this by yourself. Jesus says to them, I'm going to be there. Yes, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you by yourself. Jesus, I'm going to send you a comforter. And the book tells us later on in the Acts of the Apostle, when they were in one place and on one accord and had all things common and those who had more shared with those who had less because they had created an atmosphere of worship 
celebration and praise the Bible says and there was a sound like that of a rushing mighty wind and the spirit of God came down and fell on everyone and although they spoke different languages because they were in one place and on one accord everybody could understand what the other was saying ain't God good God said it I believe it and that settles it and so beloved while you're going around praying for every Tom Dick and Harry every Jamal and Ebony don't forget to say a little prayer for you that was an artist by the name of Dion Warren who sang a song she said every morning when I wake up and before I pick up the coffee cup I say a little prayer for you well that's a declarative sentence I don't know who I don't know who Dion was singing to but when I say to you say a little prayer for you that's not a declarative sentence but rather that is an imperative sentence in other words you are commanded you don't have a choice every now and then on this christian journey the load is rough and the going is tough and the hills are hard to climb every now and then you gotta go to your prayer coffin fall down on your knees if you can't kneel bow your head and say father i stretch my hand to thee no other help i know if you withdraw yourself from me where can i go say a prayer pray for strength pray for peace pray for hope pray for faith hold on to god's unchanging hand don't forget to say a little prayer for you because prayer changes things ah Prayer changes things. Prayer helps you go on. Even when you feel like you can't go on. I wish I had a witness. Prayer will make you make your enemies your footstool. Prayer will open doors that no one can open. And prayer will shut doors that no one can shut. I'm so glad. Amid my praying for my spouse and my children and my grandchildren and my church family and those who are experiencing health challenges and who are going through seasons of bereavement, I make certain that I don't forget to say a little prayer for me. And it's not determined by the length of the prayer, but rather it is determined by the content of your prayer. And sometimes uh, when you're in the posture of prayer and you stop and you begin to analyze and assess and reflect upon the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for you, your soul, your soul, your sanctified soul cries out Hallelujah! Thank God for saving me. I tell you, don't forget to say a little prayer for your own self. And I'm so glad I ain't telling you about what I heard, but I'm telling you what I know. God will answer prayer. And he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. I'm not telling you about what I heard, but I know for myself that God is a doctor 
who never lost a fish. I wish I had a praying church. God is a lawyer who's never lost a case. God is a battle axe in your time of war. God will be your bread when you're hungry. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget. Don't forget to say a little prayer for you. And that's not, that's not being selfish. We, we are modeling. We are emulating Jesus Christ. And so amidst your praying for this one now and, 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 and that one, please don't forget to say a little prayer. As I said, it's not predicated on length, but content. And, and, and sometimes it's just a mere phrase, help me, Lord. Because God knows the desires of our hearts. He knows what we stand in need of even before we form them in our mind. He knows. So don't forget to say a little prayer for you beloved is that part in our worship experience our worship service where we extend the open door the opportunity the invitation to Christian discipleship and, and, and one of the wonderful things about this invitation all is that required of one is that you acknowledge that you're a sinner. And guess what? You're in good company because the Bible says, all oh, have sinned and come short. None of us are as we should be. But thank God, we're not what we used to be. If you would believe, if you would confess and believe in your heart that God has raised him, Jesus, his son, his only begotten son from the dead. The Bible says, you shall be saved. My brother, my sister, if those words resonate in your spirit, dial 410-922-3286. Listen and follow the prompts. Someone will respond and walk you through the process of praying the prayer of salvation and you will be saved but then secondly maybe you're already saved and you're not a part of any church family you have not united with any church fellowship we extend the invitation for you to become a part of our church family where our motto is that we are family and that we extend our total selves to you as we together strive to become deeper in our faith walk. Again, call 410-922-3286. Listen and follow the prompts. Someone will respond, walk you through the process, and we'd be happy, we'd be glad to have you as a part of our church family. That's my prayer. Jesus. My choice. Some folks, some folks, some folks would rather have houses and land. Some folks you see.
bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you grace, hope, peace, and joy today, tomorrow, and in the days to come. And remember, say a little prayer for you, henceforth now and forevermore. God bless you.